Perfect. Welcome. Uh, welcome to another innovative talk in the frame of the module Emerging Fields in Architecture. Uh, today we have uh, another inspiring guest that is, has not been with us in the studio, in the module. So I'm very delighted to have Xavier de Castellier with us as a guest. He will be talking um, about his adventures of an interplanetary architect. So he can talk about space architecture and also about extreme architecture, experimental architecture and architecture in general. Uh, Xavier is head of design at International Design Practice Hesse. There he leads the design technology and innovation across all disciplines and regions. And for the last decade, Xavier has been an industry leader in the field of parametric design, digital fabrication, and the additive manufacturing. Prior to joining Hassel, he was a co-head of Foster and Partners internal research and development team, um, where he worked on the Apple headquarters, Kuwait and Beijing airports, Yakus and the NBQ uh, headquarters. But he also worked on the Mars project, what I know, maybe we see some of them today. At Hessel, Xavier is developing the practices, global digital design strategy for computational design, building information modeling, visualization and virtual reality. So in recent years, Xavier has built up a portfolio of architecture in extreme environments with a particular focus on space with habitat projects and he worked for NASA and ESA. Uh, Xavier is also a director of Smart Geometry, a non-profit educational organization for computational design and digital fabrication. This organization has grown to become an independent worldwide network for computational and digital design specialists. Xavier has had academic positions at Syracuse University in London, at the University of Ghent in Belgium and the Bartlett. And I have to say again, I appreciate very much to have Xavier here as a lecturer. I, I'm familiar with his work. It's very interesting and very important in the field of extreme environment and space architecture. Thank you for Xavier, welcome. Thanks Sandra, thank you so much uh, for this introduction as well. Let me just, uh, Share my screen. Start with that. Um, oh, host is able to participate in screen sharing. So now you can. No, you can. Sorry, I forgot. Now I can. Okay, good. Um, I am going to share. Oh no, that's not it. Hang on. That's better. Um, okay, cool. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Can all hear me well as well? All good? Yes. Good, good, good. Thank you. Um, so um today's talk, we're gonna talk about architecture in extreme environments and spaces, of course one of those extreme environments. Um, so maybe first a little bit of an introduction to Hassel, company I work at and where I'm uh, one of the heads of design. So we are quite a large international design firm, originally founded in Australia over, oh gosh, over 80 years ago. So we're not um, exactly a startup. Um, and we have, so we're a global company. We are, of course, still quite a few offices in Australia, in Perth, Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. And then about 30 years ago, we um, expanded into Asia, but we now have an office in Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And about 10 years ago, we have an office, start an office here in London, and where I'm based, we've got Global World, I'm kind of um, uh, mainly based in London here. And then we, I think about five years ago, we also opened an office in San Francisco. And what you see here is a little snapshot of projects that we get involved with. Um, 
lots of different types of scale, um, different locations, and a lot of top, different topologies. As you see, anything from museums to a visitor center there, offices, sports stadia, big master plans, and even kind of bizarre topologies such as a cruise terminal. Um, and we do this kind of worldwide, right? Um, and we have three disciplines, architecture, interior design, and landscape architecture. Now, uh, myself, a little snapshot of what we did and, and Sandra nicely kind of introduced a few things there already. Uh, this is kind of what I get involved with is really around innovation in design technology. So kind of looking at what are the technologies that we will be using in the next few years or uh, to really kind of help and improve our design process. Now, you can do it by just looking at hardware and, and software, such as um, analysis, environmental analysis tools. But one way I kind of find really inspiring and interesting to work, and we're kind of moving in that direction more and more, is actually looking at projects themselves and doing our own design projects. So uh, for the last few years, we, besides kind of generally looking at design tools, we're also looking at doing our own projects where we feel we can actually test out and um, almost stress test our capabilities. Um, and one of the ones I've been doing there, because how, how extreme can you get by actually going and designing on a planet? So the one in the middle there, that is of course our uh, projects for uh, Mars Habitat done uh, for NASA. Now, today I am however going to talk about two projects in two very extreme environments, but in very different places. The top one is on NASA 3 Prince Habitat on Mars. And the one below is um, an art and music center in Northern Uganda, in a place called Bidi Bidi, in actually a very extreme environment because it's the world's second largest refugee settlement. So two totally different places, but I think our strategy in both places is actually quite similar. So um, I actually quite like about talking about these projects almost side by side. Um, so but the first project I want to talk about is, of course, our Mars Habitat for NASA. Now, this was part of a Centennial Challenge. Centennial Challenge, the NASA Centennial Challenges, was a way to for NASA to kind of open up space research and work in the uh, space industry by opening it up to different industries and not only or different types of companies and not the ones that normally always get the contracts like the big space contractors um this centennial challenge was all about 3d printing a habitat on mars so that was really the task it's a very long competition i actually started when i was at fosters and i kind of then joined again uh, at a different stage of the competition when i was uh working for hassel um now you might think when you start a project like that, uh, what do you do? Because there's not exactly a lot of built precedents, right? There's precedents, but not really built precedents. So, um, so what we did was really look at, so what is out there? What kind of space habitats are there? What can we learn from? Um, there's, of course, the ISS, International Space Station, that is out there. And um, it's kind of what it looks inside. Um, and... I don't know about you all, but if you're all architects, I assume, um, if you look at a space like this, um, I think we can do better, right? I think we can create better spaces to live in than what we see here. Because don't forget, astronauts have to kind of live in these spaces for six months, up to a year, maybe. So um, for me, this is not an ideal space. Uh, living in a in a box that looks like the inside, uh, the internal bits of a machine, um, I don't think it's a great space uh, to be way too cluttered. Um, so we think we can do better. Um, people often ask me, like, so where do you get your inspiration from, right? Do you get inspiration from uh, sci-fi? And um, well, not really. I do love sci-fi, Star Trek, space, so all kind of interesting things to look at. Um, aliens, right? Um, but let's not forget, as space architects, and I kind of always stress that we should actually not get seduced by movies, 
right? Because always don't forget movies are made to uh, build a narrative around. They are there as a stage for something else. So for me, um, it's never really a good um, analogy or I do not personally do not get inspiration from movies, although this is one of my favorite sci-fi movies, Moon. Um, for me, it's more important to actually look at architects and designers who's been operating in this field before. One of them is Galina Balachova. Um, some of my, I've talked about her. She was um, the only female space architect um, in uh, the Russian space program. Well, she was the only architect, I think, that actually worked in the Russian uh, space program. And when you look at her work, there's some really lovely little books about it now published. Um, I love how completely different it looks, how kind of homey it really looks. And look at the detail, look at the kind of the veneers that's being used, look at the cushions, the patterns, look at the little curtain that's being used. Um, I think there's something special about it because it really kind of points at the direction that we do not really need. It doesn't need to look over, over technical, right? It doesn't need to be that. It can have a different look. Um, and I do love kind of, she's been involved in, in lots of projects at uh, the Russian space program. Um, this was one of them I think she was involved with, which was the uh, Russian lander, uh, which was made for one person. Uh, of course, it never, I think it actually was launched, but it never kind of went to the moon. Um, and again, these interiors looked very different, I thought. Um, and for me, that's an inspiration to kind of just knowing there can be a different look for it. Um, she has a lot of colors as well in our in her design this is of course the mirror space station that um uh, doesn't it's not operational anymore and uh, these are some of her fantastic drawings that she used like always, always using colors to kind of identify ground wall and uh, ceiling and so forth it was in the same type of color scheme um also fantastic drawings i think so for me these are important people to look at galina um, another one to look at, I think, is um, the first designer that got involved in space on NASA's side was um, a guy called Raymond Lowy. Um, and he worked on Skylab. Now, Skylab was one of the first uh, orbital stations for NASA. It was all built on uh, earlier Apollo um, architecture, really. So the modules were actually really, really big. Um, then, so this is Raymond Levy, he was, a, he was not an architect, he was actually an industrial designer, a famous American industrial designer. And he got on board when they were designing Skylab. And one of the, um, in this image here, you can actually see the two things that uh, Raymond Levy uh, implemented. Now he did, when he arrived at NASA and kind of joined the, 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 the team there, started working with them, there was a lot of skept skepticism. Right, because these are all rocket scientists, right? So uh, rocket engineers, they were really thinking like, what is this designer going to do? What is he going to do? Like choose the color? And that's one of the things he did. He did choose the color. But there are a few more things which are way more fundamental, I feel, um, that he did. One of the things was design this table. Wow, look at the table. Yeah, it's kind of a cool table, nicely designed, very technical still. Um, what's so special about it? Well, the special thing about it is that there is actually a table. In the, original, in the original design, the NASA engineers had just created some little, little tablets which just come from the wall of the uh, Skylab. So on the inside, just a little tablet here, one somewhere over else, and one over there. So basically what would happen is these astronauts, they had a meal, they would just face the wall and uh, have a meal by themselves. And it needed a designer really to kind of bring the human in the center and kind of talk about the fact that maybe three astronauts having a conversation over a meal might be quite important for the mental health of these guys of, of the functioning of these people. So, um, so it wasn't really design itself of the, of the table. It was the fact that was a table that was so important that you actually need the designer for it. Second thing, important thing he implemented you see in the back of that slide you see a little round window yeah you might think okay so why do you need a designer 
designed a window. Well, Raymond didn't actually design the window. He actually made sure there was a window. In the original design, there was no window in Skylab because it was seen as a weakness in the structure. It was seen as a risk, as an extra uh, complexity. And from an engineering perspective, you don't want that, right? Um, but in the end, they did put it in and it became a really, really important part of Skylab. Particularly, can you imagine going around the earth days, weeks, months, and never ever being able to see this, right? So I think, you know, the fact that we needed a designer to kind of put the asteroid kind of central is 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 telling, I find. And for me, that's an inspiration. These two people are actually quite inspiration for 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 their own different reasons. Um, back to Mars, right? Um, so we got the project. I think we we did what every architect does and um, look at the environment. Right? So what is the environment of Mars? What what are we really dealing with? Because you know every house, every building is really a way to kind of deal with its local environment, whatever that is, climatic, urban, so forth. So for Mars, what do we have? Well, first of all, um, you might all know this picture, Apollo taken from the Apollo 8 uh, craft uh, mission, um, taken by an astronaut that was coming around the moon and actually saw the Earth rising, which is the Earth rise picture. Well, they were probably the most important picture ever taken uh in human history now um what is quite surprising always is that proportionally um the moon is actually quite far away if you look at it so if it's earth moon this is a proportional uh distance people always think it's a bit closer um that took about three days to cover that distance and i think roughly around three hundred thousand uh, kilometers now that distance is a thousand times the distance of the ISS is from Earth. ISS is roughly around 400 kilometers, I think. So this is about a thousand times the distance, right? Now, if you go to Mars, you have to have another thousand times that, diff that difference. Now, on average, because of course, Mars and Earth rotate around the sun, so their distance is kind of different quite a bit. Um, but this is a picture taken from, I think it's a Curiosity rover, taking a picture uh, from Mars, looking back to Earth. And you see it's basically one pixel on my screen at the moment. So here you see that distance, and that distance is important for a few things. First of all, um, cost. It will be not very, it will be very costly to actually get anything to Mars. So we'll, before we go, we need to kind of make sure we, we pack cleverly, right? We're gonna pack compact and light. Right, every kilogram that you need to get to Mars, hugely expensive. Second thing is, is that because of such a distance, there is no direct communication. Like if I want to <coughs> um, uh, send a message to a rover on Mars, it will take up to 20 minutes. So you can't teleoperate stuff from Earth to Mars. So that, that, that difference, the distance, uh, means there's never direct communication. Another thing that was great about Earth is that we have an atmosphere and magnetic poles. Having these magnetic poles and the atmosphere really gives us a protection shield against radiation. Radiation from cosmos and from the sun. And that would be, you know, if we didn't have that, it would be really radioactive. It would be really bad for humans, of course. Um, the problem that we have on Mars Mars does not have these magnetic poles, uh, which means the radiation, the solar radiation and the uh, cosmic radiation is really hitting that surface uh, the whole time. So one of the major things is we need to protect ourselves from radiation, right? So that will be a very important part in our design, an important design drive. Again, a picture taken uh, again from the Curiosity rover from the Martian surface. So what else do we get there? Well, we have, uh, it's pretty cold, average minus 70, minus 50 Celsius. It goes above Celsius a little bit, but not too much. Um, you have an atmosphere that is 100 times thinner compared to um, um, Earth. And it mainly consists of uh, CO2. 
CO2 atmosphere. So we do have something there, but, um, but it's a very thin atmosphere. We also have storms, storms that can go, uh, planetary storms that will go over the whole planet and that can last up to months. And, oh, yeah, we have one third of Earth gravity, but um, that's actually more fun than anything else because it means as an architect and, and an engineer, um, you can build stuff much thinner. And that is just a fun way to, to, to design, I think. So I always kind of enjoy having that one third of uh, Earth gravity. Okay, um, then, so I already said we, we better kind of pack light and, um, and, and make sure everything is compact. So once we're going to build something there, uh, it might be good to use some local materials. Now, as you see, this is kind of Curiosity Rover looking back at its own, at its own tracks. There is not much that we have there. We have rocks and we have regolith. Regolith is Martian dust. So um, not too much to play with, to be honest. So um, this, this little video actually shows our main concepts that we have. So our design exists out of two parts. We have an internal element, which is an inflatable, kind of an unfolding inflatable. Think of it as an origami inflatable. And that is there to protect to give an atmosphere, a breathable atmosphere, a pressure um, for our astronauts. So that's really their kind of, they can live, they can survive in that bubble. Now, I also said we need to make sure our astronauts get protected from radiation. Um, the best way to do that is create mass around the astronauts. Now, best way to do that really is to go and live in a cave, right? Because you have kind of rock and regolith all around you, that would be fantastic. Now, um, we don't know where the caves are. There might be lava tubes on Mars, but we're not sure where and how big they are and how accessible they are. So one of the ideas is, is to create our own cave. And that is that kind of structure, the shell structure that you see being built around the astronaut. Now, interesting fact is that um, for this competition, this was for the NASA competition, we were actually, um, we didn't quite comply with the, uh, the rules. Because the rules said that our uh, uh, shell structure had to uh, actually contain the pressurized environment. Now, we guys, I don't really believe in that, because I think it would be extremely hard to build a structure on another planet with 3D printing that would keep uh, a, a pressurized environment. Um, so that's why we did a, a dual stage thing where we have the inflatable made on Earth. Yeah, when Earth manufacturing and Earth factories tested a gazillion times probably to make sure that our astronauts have that breathable, um, that uh, pressurizable volume to live in. And the outside, that's just a mass that really protects it from radiation. And how are we going to build it? Well, uh, one idea would be by using 3D printers. And here you see that shell structure being printed over about three years time almost by a series of small robots. Why small robots? Well, um, if I wanna print something with a massive printer, um, then I need to bring a massive printer, of course. So um, this is not a normal printing process, but a big, big gantry system. No, we're gonna have smaller robots actually working together a little bit like ants. So it's a swarm robotics system. These are our robots. Right? We have uh, four different tasks, four very different looking robots. Um, some of them actually kind of are, are, are based on existing uh, NASA concept. The one on the right hand side, our, our digger, is an actually a uh, NASA concept. Um, and they would, over years, over three years, kind of create that shell structure. Now, this is a rendering we got from our uh, visualization art, uh, artist. I think midway through the competition. And she did this kind of interesting thing because she plays it, you see on the bottom right, you see all the robots that just finished their job and they have nothing else to do. So they're gonna sit in the corner and you know, somehow create the first boneyard of robots. And I was kind of shocked by that because you know I only arrived on Mars and I already made a mess, right? I already have a boneyard, a graveyard of robots that sit there and rust. So 
I think that was a bad decision. So back to the drawing board. So what we did is we redesigned our robots in a more modular way, um, a modular way and reconfigurable way. So we created this idea of a robotic system that works like a Lego kit. So we have wheels, we have battery packs, we have diggers, um, uh, we have printers, and all together, they really create that system of uh, uh, 3D printing. You see here, get a few more wheels, you get a few diggers in it, and so you got a digger robot uh, rover. And here, this is one that can uh, sift the regolith, and here we have the printer. So, um, and this is kind of a really quick overview on how they would actually kind of reconfigure themselves automatically. Also, this system will be quite autonomous, because remember, we can't really teleoperate these robots from, from Earth. There's like a time delay of about 20 minutes. So if I would say to the rover, uh, turn left, it will take 20 minutes for my signal to arrive, for it to turn left, and then getting a signal back another 20 minutes later to tell me, yes, I've turned left or I couldn't turn left, right? So um, the whole system is actually quite autonomous. And here you see them. This is our one-wheel scout rover looking for the right regolith. Then we have the digger. Again, like I mentioned before, this is based on the, on the NASA concept um, because we have less gravity on the, on on Mars. So that's why we have these, these counter-rotating wheels that should dig themselves into the regolith to actually um, grab and lift up lots of it on the regular. This is then the printing. There's a microwaving technology um, that kind of lays down the regular layer by layer. Now you might think, oh, this is all a bit sci-fi. How do you know this actually works? Um, well, the way we kind of see our architecture and, and our designs is that we always um, look quite a few years ahead, but we never fantasize, right? No. Melting regolith or uh, similar materials with microwave has been tested, right? Uh, the, the German Space Center, also uh, PISES, uh, um, uh, research organization in Hawaii, they've tested these things. And this is now, I think ESA has done some work as well on it. So it is technology that exists. Have somebody completely designed this robot yet? No, of course not. Um, but we know the technology kind of is there at a low technology readiness level. But we know it's not sci-fi. It is kind of already proven on a certain level. Um, and in the process of designing this and actually kind of designing our robot system with it, we kind of realized we probably came across a new topology of robotics, right? Um, Left-hand side, there you have a Tesla factory where you have big robotic arms putting Teslas together. Um, very uh, efficient, right? high efficiency. Redundancy, not that great. If one of the robots fails, we need to put exactly the same robot back, doing exactly that task. So uh, if one fall, falls away, we need to be better replace that exact robot. The right-hand side, we have something called, we call Swarm Robotics. Um, I think this is Manchester University work. I should put a caption there. Um, where you have tiny robots, thousands of them, that can do a task. And even if I take half of the robots away, they can still perform the same task. They're not very pragmatic. The, the functionality of them is quite low, what they can really do. Um, but it's a super high redundancy, right? And space, very important. You know, if something breaks, what are you going to do? Um, our system, we think, has is quite pragmatic and quite efficient, like the Tesla robots, but at the same time, has a high level of redundancy, right? If I take a few wheels away, well, we can just fit a few other wheels. So it's a system that kind of, you know, that would not fall over if one wheel or one digger suddenly doesn't work anymore. We can actually kind of um, reconfigure the whole thing and make different robots. So this is our overall design. Really, we have that, that shell structure on top that really protects our, um, our, our habitat. Underneath the inflatables, we have six of them, six inflatables. And in between the, the, the six major pots, we have a small pot, which is our connector pot. And those connect two uh, inflatables, so two habitat spaces, and give an extra connection out. And the extra connection out can be different things. It can be connected to a rover, it can be connected to uh, a sample hatch, it can be connected to a suit board. So different ways how to get out or, or to connect with the outside 
environment. Um, these, uh, the shell structure first. Um, so you might think I've kind of redesigned it. Well, we actually didn't read it, but we sort of designed it. Um, the adult shell structure was given certain parameters, but we also use a computer program to really calculate the best uh, shell structure, right? So what we want to do is we create a structure that's completely built out of compression forces, right? This is actually, you might know the, uh, the Gaudi uh, work where he used hanging change. Gaudi uses change to actually, whole models of change to actually show what the perfect uh, compression lines would be of, of, of a building. Then he kind of flipped them upside down. Here we're doing the same thing. Here we're kind of designing it in, with certain constraints. Let me say it has a certain size, but the actual geometry of it is really just generated by uh, a piece of software. All right, just kind of looking at this kind of uh, seeing if we do get mainly compression only. Next thing is our inflatables, right? This is these kind of connector pods, and this is the main pods unfolding and inflating. Now, um, yeah, I think again, oh yeah, inflatables in space, that's a bit of a crazy idea. Well, not really. I think um, this is a collaboration between NASA and Goodyear. I think in 1968, they were already looking at inflatable space stations. So um, not such a crazy thing. Um, this is uh, Transat. This is a, a project from NASA looking at inflatables in space. And this really was, um, the reason for this for inflatables was they could um, launch it much smaller. And then once in space, they would kind of inflate it, have a much larger spaces. And at the same time, it would be actually quite light. Um, now, and there are inflatables in space. This was a company called Bigelow, who um, I think they're now gone bust with the uh, recession, but they actually built an inflatable space module connected here at the ISS in the International Space Station, and that inflated itself on the side of the ISS. I think this is an astronaut actually testing out a few things in there. So yes, inflatable architecture, it exists. Even so that now, Companies like Sierra Space are um, really invested in, in creating inflatables for the next International Space Station. So when the International Space Station retires, there will be some um, commercial lower Earth orbit stations, and they will be, some of the parts will be made out of inflatables. So yeah, it's not a pipe dream, it's something that is actually quite realistic. But we also like to look at the overall composition of the ISS and see if we can do better. All right, this is the Columbus module at the European uh, ESA module on the International Space Station. Very typical module, right? It's a cylinder. Why a cylinder? Well, kind of the maximum space you can get into a ferry in a rocket or a space shuttle. Um, and at the same time, it's a, a pressure vessel, which is kind of a cylinder. Um, and the way it's kind of subdivided up is in a very typical way, right? Um, you always get a, a, a direction, like not, not every, as is of course in, in micro G, you might think, well, from the walls, the ceiling, uh, the floor will be the same. Well, not really. They still have a floor, they still have a ceiling, because for the astronauts, it's actually quite important to get a direction in the space. On the left and right hand side, they mainly have the, the racks where they have the science uh, experiments happening. And top and bottom, they often have uh, storage. Now, we think that's actually not such an efficient way of working. Um, we think spatially, you can do, you can do a better job. Um, we think these things are great. Rack systems and libraries and archives where you, you, know, you have huge amount of storage. <coughs> and whenever you need something, you can open it up, go in and um, take a book and come out again and close it up again. So why can't we have the same system, we thought, in space? That's exactly what we've done with our design. We have a rack system that is radial, and there is actually all rails. So they kind of the rack opens up and closes. And the rack works for every type of space. So here we have our, uh, on the bottom here, we have the, the living space and the kitchen. 
And the next one is the gym and the sleeping quarters. Then we have a lab, then we have a greenhouse, then we have the workshop. They're all kind of spatially organized in the same way. They all have these racks that can move around and can be interchanged with each other. So we can always, if you want to suddenly have less greenhouse and more lab, we can still do that, right? Um, and you can see that here, here's our astronaut going to one of the racks, setting up an experiment probably. And if he wants to have done that, he can actually walk out and close it off and kind of go into another one. So we think that's a good way to actually look at space saving in, in space. Uh, and it's a system that we, you know, we, we ESA has been looking at that for a while as well. Um, I think our innovation was here to kind of like see if we can do it in a radial uh, manner. And uh, same thing again, the rack system on rails on the, in the greenhouse. Again, we can actually kind of have a really compact way and uh, space saving process. And this is our uh, gym in the habitat. Um, and we also have a, a VR space because you might want to control some some rovers or robots outside directly from Mars, because you can do that. There won't be a delay. Uh, and what better way to do that from a, a, a VR environment? Now, um, remember that uh, we showed you this, this idea of the robots and we want to the robots to do different tasks right? and how important that is. So it's really an idea of kind of reusing and recycling all the stuff we have there. So whatever we bring to Mars, we should really think about recycling and upcycling in a really, really hardcore way. And we started doing that with all sorts of things. So we were thinking about this. This is the uh, landing, if I'm not wrong, of the Perseverance rover. And this is a camera looking back at it, landing on Mars. So looking back at the, the, the landing parachute. And we thought, well, um, once it landed the parachute, no one's going to use it anymore, right? So why can't we reuse it? Um, so for that reason, we start working with this guy. This is Chris Rayburn, fashion designer here in London. He has a, a lab called Rayburn in uh, Hackney here in London, in East London. And what he does, well, he his designs are all done with um, uh, overstock of materials and, and, and parachutes. He actually makes jackets out and clothes out of parachutes. So um, we worked with him to really dress our astronauts. And so he kind of, he was really nice. He was an amazing guy. He lent us immediately uh, some of the pieces they did. These are all made from uh, British parachute, par parachutes. And we did the green screen uh, set up in our studio where this is not uh, an astronaut. This is Chi, one of our interior designers who is obviously now an astronaut um, and working in the workshop uh, on one of the robots. And you kind of see, we kind of put some ideas in the right hand side. You see the, the sewing machine, uh, making some new clothes maybe. Uh, and we have lots of kind of making tools there. There's a little digital fab lab on Mars. On the left hand side there, you have a big 3D printer. Um, well, remember I said, we need to pack light and compact. Um, this really here is timing. Um, Looking at his images, our living room on Mars, and you might immediately tell me, like, hang on, Sophie, this is a bit ridiculous. Uh, why do you bring that big, big furniture? Uh, well, we didn't bring it. The idea would be that we 3D print the furniture, right? Because there will be waste material. There will be waste material from the kitchen on the left hand side there, from food packaging. There will be waste material from probably the science experiments or from medical devices and so forth. So, why not reuse that plastic to then 3D print uh, furniture? For that part of the project, we worked with a good friend of mine, um, Manuel Jimenez Garcia, who has a company called Nagami, um, just outside Madrid. What they do there is, well, they print furniture and they design and 3D print furniture. That's in the factory with a whole bunch of robots there. So that's what we did. So we worked with him and he designed for us this kind of chaise longue, um, which is printed out of one bead of plastic, really. Um, and it's also made out of recycled plastics. I think what they're using here is um, medical waste plastics. So here you see the 3D printer printing our chaise longue. 
but imagine that you can even do that on Mars. And there you go. It's actually, it looks very spacey in a way. But the reason why it is is because we had to actually kind of, it looks very organic, but we had to do it out of one continuous bead of uh, 3D printed plastic. So that might looks quite fancy like that. Um, remember what I said about um, need to protect yourself? Or of course, here you see our astros being protected. But being protected also means not really having that view. And remember how important that's at Skylab and now here at the International Space Station, how important that view really is for astronauts. View is important, but at the same time, we need to protect it. So we have these flaps on the ISS, on the cupola, that really protects it from uh, debris. And uh, so what are we going to do with our... Um, um, uh, habitat. How are we going to protect our windows? Well, you can do it like this, like a very mechanical way of doing it, or you could use a very architectural way, and a very architectural way to protect somebody from radiation or from the sun. Huh. This one, it's not a technical solution at all. It's an architectural solution. It's a courtyard. A courtyard this is a Mediterranean courtyard, Tunisian, I think, um, that um, protects the inhabitants from direct sunlight. Great thing is, no direct sunlight, but at the same time, they do get indirect sunlight. And the fantastic thing about a courtyard is you get great views across your habitat. So um, we did the same thing. Just see this, this render already. Um, there's no direct sunlight hitting our habitat, but at the same time, we have this connection between the different pods and a, a longer view, which we think is important. Um, and for that, we use the tools that we use in, in architecture anyway. Uh, we use some solar analysis tools where we can check. Yes, we had to kind of trick the software a little bit to kind of make sure it was it was operating on Mars. Um, but here we kind of show how there is no direct sunlight in our pods, um, and they basically do sit under this this shell structure. And this is a little physical model we made of the project. But again, you also nicely see the different rack systems and how they are used in the different pods. Now, besides doing the, the, the architecture, for us, what's really important is to also do the mission architecture. So it's not just important to, to, to know what you're going to build, but how it gets there. To do that, we actually worked with the students of Cranford University, with Professor David Cullen, and he, uh, with his students, kind of built the backbone of our design. So they, one of the things they, for example, looked at, like, how many robots do we need? How much energy do they need? How long did it take to dig? How long did it take to print? So they did all the systems engineering and the mission architecture for our project. Um, now, in the end, we did get beautiful uh, graphic on the left-hand side. That was not, that was, we actually used then another illustrator to actually take all their spreadsheet information and into this beautiful uh, diagram. Now, and another thing we did is actually we worked with a lot of scientists and a lot of engineers on our uh, design. And the way we do that is by um, a very design-centric way is we do crit. We invite everyone, we give everybody a big pen and some post-it notes and everybody can come around and talk about our design and discuss it and tell us what wouldn't be working. Right, so it's a very open design process that, that we follow, and we always quite and uh, we we keep on doing that to kind of open it up to lots of expertises. In that room, we had space anthropologists, psychologists, mining experts, robotic experts, uh, Martian meteorologists, um, you name it, uh, radiation expert, you name it. We had people in the room to actually kind of discuss and critique our design because we think that is so so important. At the end, we were very, very lucky once we finished the project that um, at the same time, there was a, the, at the Design Museum in London, there was an exhibition called uh, Moving to Mars. So it's all about design and Mars. So it wasn't only about the science. Um, and we had the opportunity, we were very lucky that the Design Museum sponsored us and we were able to kind of build one of our habitats in a one-to-one. -one. Again, here, all the furniture is 3D printed. We have an inflatable and we have that view out. It's not a real view. It's a big, big screen, uh, but it was all real time. So this was all built in uh, an uh, Unreal Engine. So you can actually see the day changing as well in the habitat. Um, and the racks, we built the racks. The racks were movable. You can move them 
left to side. Um, and this is one of those views in our, this was like an, a six meter diameter habitat. And what I'll do next is I'm gonna, so I'm gonna stop sharing and then reshare because I want to do is show a little video. So I'm gonna optimize for video and I'm going to, doesn't that work? Uh, okay, I hope this works. Okay. There we go. Half a century ago, we took our first step on the surface of the moon. Today, there is renewed passion to explore for our Everybody next human this? endeavor. Yeah. Mars, the red planet, further than any human has ever been. We face many challenges, remoteness, no livable atmosphere, high radiation, dust storms, and extremely low temperatures. Before any humans set foot on Mars, we must first design a protective shelter. We will protect our astronauts from radiation with a thick 3D printed shell structure using Martian regolith, which works great in compression but does not perform well under tension. To overcome this shortfall, we have chosen to construct the pressure retaining parts of the habitat from lightweight inflatable pods. They will be made out of high precision engineered composites that are prefabricated on Earth. Their elliptoid geometry will be able to mitigate the pressure differences whilst optimizing spatial planning. To create the base on Mars, we will use a two-phase approach. In phase one, an ecosystem of 3D printing robots will arrive months in advance of any human explorer. They will construct the protective shield for the base by adopting a modular robotic swarm strategy, a plan that allows for redundancies and enhances the odds for success. Intelligent autonomous robots will have interchangeable roles, from battery storage to scout rovers, logistics to excavational and even 3D printing units, all integrated with multiple cameras and sensors for navigation. They can reconfigure themselves for a multitude of purposes, ensuring prolonged usage beyond the initial build phases. The smallest configuration is the one-wheeled scout rover that uses ultrasonic scanning to analyze the Martian surface to determine the best regions for obtaining optimum regolith. The digger receives the location coordinates and then excavates the Martian soil. It then delivers the payload to the refining assemblies. Here, large chunks of Martian regolith can be processed down to a finer grain and then delivered to the melter robots in situ. They then use concentrated microwaves to melt the regular and extrude through the 3D printing nozzle. The shell is autonomously 3D printed, layer by layer, over several months by the robotic system. In the next phase, the first astronauts arrive with the habitation units, equipment, and supplies. The robots now take on their second life roles to aid the next phase. They come together to make flexible mobile platforms that can carry the payload from the loading zone to the base. The convoy begins its journey across the Martian surface to the habitat site. The build commences with a connector module placed underneath the protective shield and ready for inflation. The module then unfolds and self-inflates into its final form. The habitation units are then placed into position and sequentially inflated to form the completed pressurized environments. The circular layout of the habitat ensures continuous accessibility of the habitat in the event of a catastrophic failure. Each connector module houses three integrated environmental control life support systems, delivering essential services like power, water, data and oxygen to all the habitation units. A circular conduit delivers these services to multiple endpoints in each pod. The base will be remotely powered by two nuclear kilo power reactors and a solar farm, located a safe distance away from the base. In the next stage, the astronauts will construct and install a flat pack, rail-based racking system capable of connecting to the distribution system, enabling spaces to reconfigure according to their spatial needs. This modular and radical design principle has been adopted for all the habitat pods, ensuring multi-use, reconfigurable environments. A Martian base should not just be a habitat. It is home for the astronauts. Each pod expresses its own identity, quality, and character. A highly functional design which places the human experience at the core. Spaces include a state-of-the-art research laboratory, 
hydroponic greenhouse, a fully equipped workshop with digital fabrication facilities, the sleeping quarters with gym facilities, and immersive virtual reality platform. We believe that the key to success of human habitation on Mars is the health and well-being of its residents. Creating a place where work life and living combine holistically to ensure they feel connected to each other, to themselves, and somehow to their distant home. So that was video one. Um, hang on, let me now just go here, share this. Um, okay. Um, now, all the way from space back to Earth. So I said I was going to talk about two projects, right? So this is the second project. I'll try to do this within 15 minutes. Um, so very, very different location. But for me, it's... Um, you know, as a designer, I think it's almost the same way of looking at design. Right? It's the same way of having quite extreme environments, difficulties to getting stuff to site, difficulties to getting stuff built, limited resources. Um, so this project is um, an art and music center in northern Uganda, which is near the border of uh, South Sudan, a place called Bidi Bidi. And it's a refugee camp. And it's a refugee camp of, uh, this is the camp of about 270,000 people live there. And I'm personally, I'm originally from Ghent in Belgium. And um, it's not the same size. For me, it's kind of interesting to always think that way that it's the same size of my, of the city I grew up in. Um, now, BDBD has been around, I think, for about six years, I think, or a little bit longer. Uh, 270,000 people living in this camp now if you look at it it looks quite different than what you think um, a refugee camp looks if i when before i started this project when i thought refugee camp i thought rows and rows of white un tents right this is not like this this is a camp where all the uh, inhabitants actually built their own houses and they build in the traditional way to so build them in uh, out of mud and it's a little bit of wood and straw. Now, these huts are, you know, uh, not really to live in all day long. They're there to cook in and they're to sleep in. Uh, they don't have any windows. They have only one door. And in principle, there's nothing, of course, wrong with these habitats because it's quite a traditional way of building something in, in the countryside there. The problem is, of course, that you have 270,000 people living in a very, very small plot together. There is no agriculture possible, of course. There is no economy um so there is also no sanitation there is no water um and no electricity so um we uh decided to work or we were asked to work with a, a foundation called the to foundation and what they they've been working in refugee camps for for quite a while now and they got inspired by this uh, this is uh zach spilangalanga he's an artist in um in Uganda, and the foundation we work for actually kind of uh, sponsored this guy. I think five years ago, something like that. And they um, they uh, recognized his talent, and what it did, they kind of funded him a, a small, small recording studio and some equipment, and he became a number one hit in Uganda. And that was kind of the inspiration for this. So why don't we actually? provide a bigger space for more people who are, are great in music and arts and to be quite entrepreneurial about it. So um, the idea that uh, to your, the TO organization had, a foundation has, is to build a music and art center, right? On a much larger scale. This is our design um, of, of the center. Um, the idea is to have a performance space, to have a classroom, to have uh, an exhibition space and a recording studio. Um, and also this would not just be built, this would actually be the first cultural center of uh, BDBD. Because there's you know, there's many, many issues in, in BDBD. 
um, um, there's famine, there is not enough healthcare, not enough schools, but there is also a lot of kind of NGOs already working on that. Um, but we thought let's actually kind of do something slightly different that actually is looking at entrepreneurship and culture. Um, and that's why we kind of looked at this building. Um, it's very it's quite a simple building. It's an elliptical shape, um, where here you see the performance area. Um, the, there's actually two centers in this project, right? You've got one is a performance, and the other one is, um, can you see on the left hand side? I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and this is our uh, music classroom that we've built in. And oh, the interesting thing we also thought is like we only are our, our auditorium fits about 200 people and we wanted it to be bigger but we didn't have the money to make a much bigger one so we decided to kind of open it up in the back so you kind of create a much larger naturally a much larger uh performance space and much larger audiences can join but one of the things that we also kind of found out immediately when we went to um bdpd and we we're working with our local uh architect uh local works um the water the water is a big problem right um there are water wells but also imagine there's 270,000 people without sanitation so the water isn't the cleanest so we thought well once we kind of build this big building and have a big roof uh, let's make sure that roof does does a few things so why don't we actually collect all the water from the roof centrally and actually make that re event really so um so we created this kind of quite massive funnel shaped roof that collects all the water in the center of the uh the art center and then you can see that the performance happening in the front and in the back there you get the water being collected and it will be done through these massive gutters that are in the structure itself and um, that also create light wells to bring hopefully as much light as possible into the building um now, uh, geometry for that became quite complex, as you've been seeing. Well, first, we have an elliptical building, and uh, second, we have this offset uh, geometry here. Um, so you might think this is going to get really, really expensive. Well, um, interestingly enough, um, I've spent quite a few years of my life uh, doing just that, is looking at complex geometry and make it buildable. Um, I worked many years at Fostrand Partners, with some of the projects I, I was involved with, looking at how to optimize and rationalize buildings. And that's kind of what we've done right here as well in BDBD, where, um, oh, sorry, this is a project, for example, we did in Smithsonian, the Fostrand Partners project. Um, it looks very curved everywhere. Uh, it looks probably all made out of curved glass, but not really, because if you look at the top, you see this is the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. That is all built out of flat pieces of glass. So that was kind of my trick. Like, how can I make sure again here in BDBD that everything is out of built out of very simple materials, flat pieces of sheet metal, right? Not glass, but sheet metal. Now, I know that um, a cone geometry, I can build a cone out of, I can um, build that out of flat pieces of, of, of uh, corrugated metal, flat pieces of metal um because that's what uh geometry allows you to do a truncated cone it's kind of the same thing now if i skew that cone actually all these panels stay planar so that's actually quite quite important that we don't get very complex pieces of metal they're all planar pieces i can then just flip it around i have the cone but and then um uh, so it's kind of put it upside down so i can still have flat pieces and then Instead of an ellipse, I actually build the ellipse out of three parts of arcs. And by doing that trick, I know all the panels in this roof, rather complex shaped roof, will actually be quite simple and it will be flat, flat pieces. So um, that was our trick. How do we kind of create a building that is actually might look very special and, and, and complex and interesting, but at the end of the day is actually built out of simple geometries? Same thing for the elliptical shape. You might think, well, an ellipse, that's a kind of a, a nightmare to set out on site. Well, not really. If you think about an ellipse, the, the geometry of an ellipse is I could actually draw an ellipse by having two um, 
sticks in the floor and a wire and, and, and just a rope. If I have the rope in between them, uh, a rope is a bit longer, I can actually kind of then draw a massive ellipse, right? So that's the kind of definition of an ellipse is that the, the distance from the two centers, the, the, the total distance of those two to the point of the ellipse is always the same, right? So it's constant. So um, that's a kind of a trick where we kind of say, well, it's a complex shape, but actually setting out on site would be fairly easy. Other important thing is that we had to work with the local architect. I think is I can't stress enough how important that was. We did not design this first here in London and then through gave it to the local architect. No, we kind of started with them from the beginning. Um, so this is Local Works, a company based in Uganda, headed by a guy called uh, Felix Holland, we've been working with uh, now for, for quite a bit. We learned a lot from him, right? Learned a lot about the local uh, techniques of, for example, using SSBs, which are solidified soil bricks. Why these bricks? These are just compressed bricks. They are non-fired because there's not enough wood in the area, right? So we want to make sure that we can make it out of local uh, earth, and compressed, uh, purely compressed, and those were actually strong enough to actually build our building out. These are these kind of uh, presses that actually kind of uh, make your building blocks. A uh, very sustainable way, we actually use the, the material that is right around the camp. So again, a bit like Mars, we use very, very local material. We then also do a lot with these blocks, right? We want to make sure that they, they kind of perform really well. So one thing they do is they bring in natural daylight. And what about just making openings in the walls? But by positioning them in a particular way, they actually work also as a diffuser in the um, music classroom. So they have acoustical uh, performances. And in the recording studio, they even work as a Helmholtz resonator. So they kind of absorb the sound and also diffuse the sound at the same time. So we kind of go actually quite technical with them and let them do a lot of work, our very simple bricks. And this is like the center uh, rendering of it that you see, kind of, it opened up from the back. So we kind of make sure we have as much uh, audience as we can in the center. Uh, we went out to Uganda in September. This is us kind of, again, testing out lots of technology, as I mentioned at the beginning. This is with a HoloLens uh, with Maui, who's one of the people from Senior Locator, who are, um, the interesting thing also about this project is that we're working directly with the refugees. Uh, Maui and Victor, on, on the picture, they are refugees. And uh, they're actually living in the camp. Um, and they will be the ones that will be the owners and the, and the, the people that will operate the center. So we're not we're going directly with the refugees, which is a fantastic way uh, of working. There's actually Maui's family that lives there in the, I'll show you the first pictures, uh, where the, the, the houses are built. So it was a, a really sobering way for us to kind of go there after after having designed it, and kind of seeing where it will be and, and what families and people it will benefit. And you know, we did lots of kind of presentations as well to all the local stakeholders um uh, in the camp and and the local people so it was a fantastic way to kind of really connect with them and then this is then in kampala where we are now we were checking the the, the first mock-ups um that was in september we are now uh on site um and i think we'll be now three weeks on site um and we're getting um we're not out of the ground yet we're still doing foundations of course that will take a while um, but these are the, the mock-ups of that structure. So hopefully in about a year's time, the project should be finished. So a very different project for me. Um, but in a way, I still think that uh, people find it always kind of interesting that I present this project and a space project in the same lecture. But for me, it is really thinking about how to work sustainably, how to design uh, very effectively with the little material that you have and really think about all the logistics, right? For us, it was really important to get all the bricks there done, designed and manufactured locally and only have that, that kind of a lightweight steel roof uh, being imported. So it's quite a similar approach, I think, to our project in uh, on Mars in the end. So I went a bit of time, but um, I think, I hope that is still okay. <laughs> Sandra. So yeah, I think I've seen that about a gazillion questions. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Xavier. <clears throat>
brilliant information, interesting project. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, um, do you want to go to the questions or what do you want to what do you want yes, to do? Or? I'd like the students to ask you themselves. Okay, good. So Leon, you are the first one. So um, I had the question about the sunlight coming into the inflatable mm. pots and um, mm. you answered the question already. So <laughs> I think there's no need for that. Uh, yeah. Okay, you have another question? So you never, you get direct, indirect sunlight. You get in, of yes. course, uh, never direct sunlight. One of the ideas that we do have, of course, is that we, we would create spaces or parts in the shell structure that when there is... Um, a, a, a solar event where you have high, high radiation that you actually, the, the, the astronauts will actually go into a certain area of the habitat where there is more protection. So you could, you don't need to have protection always everywhere. You know, uh, you could actually kind of have certain areas where you have more protection and other areas where you have a bit less. Also kind of, it's also depending on like where you spend most time. If you spend a lot of time in areas, you should actually protect that the most. They do that in the on the ISS as well. They're kind of in certain areas okay. where they sleep, where they have a bit more protection than others. Like a panic room. Basically, yes. Yeah. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a super interesting question and a very important one indeed, right? Uh, yeah. Light is important for us humans. So it is essential for an architect. I mean, I think, Xavier, it would be important on Earth too, right? But uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. space is <laughs> super relevant. That I yes. know how to deal with artificial lighting and natural lighting. Mm. Absolutely. And at least, well, the good thing, at least on Mars, you do have, you know, it's a 24 and a half Earth hours day. Right, so a day lasts about half an hour longer on Mars. Uh, so you do get day and night. And if you would be on the moon, it would be slightly different. Where you, if you would be, for example, on the Shackleton crater on the South Pole, it would be day all the time. You, you'll have the horizon kind of on the sun on the horizon all the time, just in a different location, right? Over 28 days. Um, so yeah, you don't need to kind of, um, but it's interesting to kind of make sure you have that day and night uh, uh, rhythm as well for the astronauts. Other questions? Um, Leon, you're finished? Yes. Okay, great. Then we have Martina. Uh, yes, but my question was also actually kind of answered because I was wondering whether you have any learnings from designing for space um, like that you could use for designing for extreme environments, but you just actually showed the example of Uganda with the light white roof. So <laughs> the yeah. before, uh, before that, so. Um, yeah. Well, look, I always think it's it's always the other way around. I think like people always go like, oh, you design something for space. So um, you better tell us what, what application you would have from earth, right? I always look at it, Differently, I always look at it while, you know, designing for space, let's also kind of look at what things we've learned over hundreds of years designing on Earth and actually use that in space. So I always flip it around. Because the question is always like, oh, you're designing for space and that, like all the effort and expense, but you better bring it back. And I'm like, well, it's the other way around as well, you know? Mm -hmm. We design for space with the, with the knowledge that we, that we have on Earth. And um, could you say how like a project team is composed? And um, I mean, you said you, uh, you said already that you're involving scientists and, and engineers, but could mm. you give a bit more detail, like the size and who else is, might be involved? In the oh yeah, of course, of course, of course. So uh, the Mars project, I would say three months with one, three to four people. Um, the projects on um, in Uganda, was me and one person for six months, mm -hmm. roughly. Yeah, a little bit more. Sounds like a lot maybe. more people, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the trick was the trick is to um, so the designers are also very good computational designers. 
which means so digitally very, very, very good people as well. So, for example, the project in Uganda was done completely parametrically. So when we had to make changes, we can just change them parametrically. Um, so that was the that was really the trick. Um, and the same thing for the space projects. You know, we we try to be quite clever in that way um, and work with small teams, uh, but with very high skilled architects. Yeah. It doesn't need to be. Um, and they all have some experience in space, but I think the most important thing is that they're good designers, right? I, I do not need the most space savvy designers in the team because that's you just connect and it's it's simply for other projects, I think, you know, like um you don't need to be the world experts in airports to design an airport. You kind of get help as an architect. What you do is then you get help from experts. To kind of design these places and these spaces, right? Um, that's why we, we do get help from engineers and scientists and all sorts of people to kind of input in the project. Um, but I think we always have to never forget about designing for space that we're designers and architects. And that's a very value, big value. You don't need to become the engineers. They'll never, they'll never do that, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Xavier, please. Now I have to use this. Uh, tell us the advantage of an architect in the space engineering based environment. Mm -hmm. What can we do better? Why does this, uh, why do they need architects? Well, the funny thing is, is they, um, they don't know they need us. We know that, um, but we have a little trick up our sleeve, right? So the trick is that we are experts in creating visions that don't exist. We are experts in creating very seductive images and narratives that they can't do, right? So we start with that. We always start with bringing in the best, I think, I spend a lot of time the images that we create for our projects, I spend a lot of time working with the best visualization artists in the world, really, to kind of make sure these images are like spot on, that they're super, that's super important. And that really attracts everybody else. They go, oh, wow, this is, this is amazing. Can you do an image for us like this? And I'll go like, yes, but actually it's not just an image. There's a whole design process behind it. So for me, my, my kind of <laughs> way in is always working around the the imagery that we can create, the skill that we have as an architect and designer. And that's my hook in. And then once I've got the hook in, I can actually talk about what the design process is as well. Great, thanks. Julian, what's your question? So when you showed the animation of the construction process, I wondered how you would deal with the overhangs of the structure of the couple of the dome structure so Refresh. would there be any support structure beneath or would there like just be or could you just print it because of the lower gravity and maybe yeah. one more stupid question how would the one-wheeled robots turn actually <laughs> okay i'll answer the stupid question first that is a very good one and uh, every every mechanical engineer that sees the video first types in that question like how the one wheel rover will turn around right and it's too much energy because you need the gyroscopes and blah 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 yeah, it's probably true. Probably won't work. One wheel rover too well. Um, we haven't actually solved it yet, uh, but that's okay. You know, we, um, you know, not. I, I don't actually claim to kind of have solved the whole process. What I do believe is that having a modular system of robotics is probably the way forward. And having different types that actually work together and um, are able to do that. Your first question you had two um yes well spotted how do you support because um, to kind of close the dome you'll have to do something right you can't just kind of print in thin air right it's going to fall down we had two we had two things i haven't showed in the in the in the, in the render and in the video it doesn't actually show that first thing was that i um we had this idea of having an inflatable to kind of support the printing process as a as a scaffolding, like a first inflatable that kind of that sits there and then you can print on top of that inflatable, and then we would take away the inflatable. 
that was our first idea. But we, we were never really kind of convinced about it because we thought like we just said pack light and compact and you're going to have to bring this massive inflatable that's just there to kind of as a support structure. So we actually went away from that. Um, one thing that we've, our, our second proposal is, is that we really use um, the earth or the regolith itself as a support structure. So you don't see it in the video, but we did the calculation for it, is that we would actually kind of fill the whole dome with earth anyway and the earth itself would be the, the sorry not the earth the regular itself would be the support structure right and in the end you just kind of take away all the the loose regular from underneath and you kind of your structure kind of stays up we looked at it it will take about a year longer to build that but you know we got time it doesn't matter so again it's a simple it's a super simple thing we just use the regular that we have locally just to create a mountain for to to do the uh, the support it's a system that's been used on earth as well if you look at sana uh, it has done a museum like that the shell structure in japan it is one of the i forgot what it was called now uh look it up sana museum shell structure you see they actually used earth formwork to uh create that one so it's a similar technique. again we look at some earth examples yeah okay next thank you no worries Thank you, Julian. Uh, Christian. Yeah, hello. Um, so my question was, uh, you said it's great to make architecture in space, uh, especially on Mars, because you need only a third of the material you will need on Earth. Um, but how do you deal with the extreme wind speeds and other um, are there some simulations to work with them? Uh, um, so, have you watched uh, The Martian, the movie, Matt Damon? Have you watched that one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, you know what happens in the first scene, right? They have a massive storm on Mars. Everyone's get blown away. Matt Damon gets blown away. <laughs> massive, massive drama. Um, although Martian is actually quite accurate, that first scene is a bit of nonsense. Because, yes, there are high wind speeds on Mars, to, I think about 200 kilometers an hour, right? But remember what I said? The atmosphere is, is about 100 times less dense on Mars. Wind pressure is the amount of particles that hit your body, right? If I have 200 kilometers amount of wind, but less particles hitting my body, it's not going to feel like a 200 kilometer wind on, on Earth. So actually... These storms are often really kind of like a haze of a lot, a lot of dust that comes up. They're not like a storm that you should, that you would experience like you see in the Martian, right? So it's kind of very different. It's a very different experience. Oh, great. Never thought about that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, well, it's actually, Again, about gravitational force, um, like the images you've showed uh, suggest that it's kind of comparable to like how it is on Earth. Like you have a lot of material lying around and stuff. So is it actually about this or how do you calculate that into your design? Of What do you mean? How much how much regular there is or? No, just like inside of the, the renders you showed us. It's kind of yeah. it looks like it's staged on Earth, actually. So is it like comparable on Mars, like for the interior design and stuff? Is there anything yet that you have to calculate into your design about? Um, for interior, well, one of the interior, for the interiors, we um, we wanted to look quite earthy, you know? We, we, we wanted to be, why wouldn't it be, uh, what? it doesn't need to be look like the ISS, where it looks like you're in the middle of the machine or something like that. So why would I want to live in a space like that? So the things we do is we add a lot of kind of tactile materials. We have like wood veneers, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, we even look at um, one of the ideas that we had is like uh, growing bamboo because it grows quite fast. To want to grow bamboo to then use finishing materials or maybe make furniture out of. So you could actually start thinking at a slightly different materials um, economy on the, in a place like Mars. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to be also look quite tactile and cozy for the astronauts to live in. So why wouldn't it look quite earthy or like a really cool space to live in Earth? So I always think like, you know, if it looks like I really want to move in, I think it's kind of in the right direction, you know? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Martina. Um, I already asked my question. All right, Heidi. Yeah, um, I just really liked seeing the pictures of your interiors for the for the Mars habitat because most of the pictures I saw until now were like not really livable spaces, I would say, or not comfortable spaces. So I really like that. And my question is a bit silly, but I was just wondering if you could imagine living there yourself, if you should ever have the chance. That's, that's a good question. Um, yeah, but I'm not going to go on the first mission. I'll go like on like mission 100, when all the technical difficulties are sorted out, and when there is a bit more reliability in the in the rockets flying to Mars. <laughs> so yes, I would, but I'll. I won't be the first ones because I think it's still very, very dangerous, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, if there's a bit of comfort, I'll go. <laughs> and reliability, uh, less dangerous. I can imagine. <laughs> Thank but you. I'm not. I'm not a space architect that wants to become an astronaut, right? I'm not. I'm not obsessed by. I'm obsessed by architecture. I'm not. I'm not want to be an astronaut. So it's kind of maybe different, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this input. Uh, yeah. Maybe that is also a know-how or a characteristic that is relevant for our profession, Xavier, that we don't mm. have to be in that space, right? No. Architects <laughs> are trained to design for someone or for activities that they have not experienced. Yeah, and it's and that's that's what we do, right? We can Done all sorts of things for all sorts of places that we've never been, and and you know we don't need to, you know, live in them or have that experience. But I think that's that's part of our profession, isn't it? But if we could live in the places that we design, that's good. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Vincent, what's your question, please? Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is like the outer show, which is 3D, uh, 3D printed, but, like you told us it, it protects us from radiation, direct sunlight, but couldn't it also be, be more like used as an energy source and stuff like that? Like perhaps uh, any solar panels or windmills? And my second yeah. question is when you, when you look out uh, like the inside, um, mm. you use the inside of the outer shell like for like illuminated like to imitate sunlight or stuff like that, or like any. Uh... Well, we have we have our solar panels which are based uh, away from the from the um, uh, from the habitat because you know you just kind of we do have enough space on Mars. We're the only ones there, um, and um, so you know, kind of like putting the solar cells on top of the habitat would just be complicated right just put them somewhere in a field over there um so yeah i think it's uh, it's not really necessary to to over complicate things sometimes so we want to do so in space you need to do stuff simple i think and you know that shell structure if it's just to have one function i think that's actually five it would have more functions yes maybe maybe we can use it for thermal mass i always thought to use it in a certain way but I haven't quite figured that one out and um, so yeah potentially potentially but never over complicate things i would say all right <laughs> thanks giovanni yeah hello um i had uh, another question about the outer shell of this um this 3d printed shell and um, it's regarding its redundancy because you were saying about the robots that are actually 3D printed are designed to be redundant and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, and this shell is supposed to be a little bit delicate. I, I don't know how long it can last. Uh, although it's supposed to be massive and pretty thick, is it um, part of the design to be um, like built upon even like by astronauts so maybe like men in a space suit or uh to be rebuilt or maybe like that and mm. a second question was uh have you actually thought about uh, using a vacuum in mars is it uh, av um, available as a technology to protect yourself from the radiation or 
that's overcomplicated, as you just said. Well, the hackium doesn't actually protect you from radiation, right? Um, it needs mass. You have particles that need to be stopped somehow. So a vacuum is not going to help you at all uh, for radiation. Um, we. It's interesting. The other thing that you said about the, you said about the kind of make changes of the repair and all that, right? The three printed shell. So one of the things we're looking at now is a new project we're doing for the European Space Agency, is um, looking at print not printing the shells anymore, but actually making them out of uh building blocks so we kind of build the blocks first and then we kind of connect them all and creating this kind of shell structure so slightly different way we're doing that because we think then in the in the future we can then probably reconfigure it we can actually take the parts of, uh, apart because we spent lots of energy kind of creating these blocks take them apart and kind of build something else out of it so um because if you print it you print it and that's it right you can't adjust it anymore right you can't change it um so for that reason, uh, we're working. We have now a slightly different approach to it, which we we're investing at the moment. We've got a project for a lunar uh, habitat, which we're gonna you'll probably see in a, uh, in a few months' time. I hope we're gonna come out to the press with that. Hopefully March. I think we have a, a new video on that one as well, which would be great. Very interesting uh, approach. Would be interested cool. to see how it comes. Thank you. Uh, Sasha. Yeah, um, so I was wondering how long would it take to transport all the different components to Mars um, until the habitat is finished and the people can really live there? I, I think I need to go back to my to the to all the analysis that the Cranfield students did. <laughs> but I think the whole mission was like 12 years. So um, it took quite a while. You know, this is also not the first mission to Mars. You have to understand that this is not the first missions. They will just be and uh, habitats that are being built on Earth, and they probably won't stay that long, uh, probably maybe a month or so, and then come back. So um, yeah, this is for like the generation after the first missions to Mars. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, Julian, you have another question or has it been answered? Uh, I don't think it has been answered yet. So I wondered why you, or did you consider origami structures for your habitat instead of the just elliptical one? Because I think there are like a few designs around which use origami structures mm. or tessellations to make it more sturdy or maybe even implement some functions into the walls. Or was it just clear from the beginning that you would use the balloon like oh, structure? We Mm. So we have like the, the the reason why we have that is that we want to have a structure that is inflatable because that's the most compactable and and lightest. But on the other hand, we wanted our inflatables to sit on the regolith, right on the on on the rough surface, and then we also needed to connect to other pods. So the parts that are connecting to other pods, the part that sits on the surface, are all what we call hard shell elements. They are like like non-inflatable elements. And those are the bits that kind of fold up, right? And then the other bit, the top part is actually inflatable. So that's the reason why we have um, two systems there. For our next design that we're doing on, with ESA on, on the moon, we actually went the other way around. We do more inflatable, um, but we lift the whole module up from the, from the ground. And we, we have quite a novel way of actually being able to kind of make that structurally work as well. So, uh, yeah, what we try to do, each project that we do, we kind of make changes to it and, and kind of keep on adapting. And uh, some of the concepts are still the same that I've always used. It's having having inflatables under uh, shell structures that protect yourself. We've always played with that. But we kind of, how you do it, we actually change that quite a bit and kind of refine the design in each new project. Okay, I'm looking forward to that one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mike. Yeah, thanks for the amazing lecture. I was wondering about the project in Uganda. Maybe I missed it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. who's, fun who's funding the project and why did you start working on this project? Because like, it's a like a special project to find um this topic mm -hmm. and to have it somewhere where it's like mm -hmm. super poor and 
Mm -hmm. like, yeah. um, the project came to us through the uh, foundation, the Swiss foundation called TO. Um, and I actually, I met the founder of that foundation uh, because he visited our, visited our Mars uh, Habitat project in the Design Museum. And we started talking and, uh, and he showed me what they were doing. I showed him what, what we were doing, other work. And um, yeah, and that's where it came from. So oh, there was wow. a foundation already, uh, and they're already working in Africa quite a bit. And is it like only men for Uganda or are they also working in other countries? And uh, they're working okay. in Senegal, they're working in Uganda, they're working in South Africa, I think as well. But that project is particularly for, for Uganda. Right. So they're working in a few places in Africa. Okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you, Maike. Michel. Uh, Michel Strieski. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, me. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, I just, I was just Hi. wondering um, how we want to deal with the with the temperature difference on Mars, according to this Mars habitat, mm. because uh, those uh, you no know, inflatable modules uh, look very, like the walls look very thin. So yeah, I was just wondering how we want to deal with mm. the isolation. Yeah, well, the one that you saw in the design museum was of course not thermally insulated, um, but they will have to be thermally insulated, right? Um, we might need to work with uh, nanogels or something like that for the, for the transparent part. Uh, we're not sure yet, you know, so um, it will mainly be done uh, through uh, an installation system in the inflatable that we will need to be doing. Okay, thank you. Okay, Karina. So um, my question is related to the sanitary facilities. I don't know if uh, it was a big part um, to think about in the project, but um, I'm always wondering um, how, yeah, um, is there a sort of drain system uh, in this project where water goes and how does water come? And also another question of mine is um, people um, are producing also trash and um, how do you cope with this problem? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so the, the toilet thing is, well, we would be using, um, we recycle constantly, you know, the same system that you have on the ISS, they will recycle the, or the urine, for example, gets fil filtered out. So um, our system is, again, you've got that that kind of, you saw in the video, we've got this, uh, the surfaces around the circle each time of, of, of the habitat. So that will have lots of different services, uh, waste, uh, water, air, everything will actually go through that kind of uh, surface route. And the, the, the pods, the connection pods, that's where you get the, um, everything gets all the life support. So it's there. that's where you, for example, also your, your CO2 needs to be transferred to oxygen and so forth. So these are the systems that will do this. So this is really built in. Of course, we haven't designed the whole thing in detail, but we kind of, have seen, um, you know, systems on the ISS, or for example, there's there's a system now out of the Moxie, which is um, this um, uh, part that is in the I think the Perseverance rover that is now looking at can they create oxygen out of CO2 or Mars, right? So all these things are being worked on, you know. So we kind of assume that these things will be available we just kind of already create a space within our architecture where this technology could could exist in so you will have one canister of water per example and this is getting recycled all the, all the time yes yeah, okay Thank you. okay understand thank you thank you karina um thank you xavier uh it was a great talk and thank you all for your lecture, uh, for your question. Is there one last question that we can... Yeah, I need to get going as well. I need to pick up the kids from school. So <laughs> Then, Xavier, thank you for your input, for your patience and for answering the question. And see you soon. Have see you soon, day. everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.